tonight. Ottawa says it's time to say goodbye to single-use plastic. If there's an option, of course, people are going to use the plastic. The federal government says plastic bags, cutlery, plates, straws, and more will be banned as early as 2021. So what's the alternative? I actually saw the rage come out of him. She says she faced traumatizing treatment at the hands of Canadian border officers, and she's not alone. CBC reveals hundreds of complaints against the only major law enforcement agency in the country that investigates itself. And one more win. It's totally worth it. Like, this is history being made, right? Raptors superfans are already camped outside Jurassic Park hoping for front row seats to history tomorrow night. Is Toronto ready? Is Canada ready? This is The National. CBC News has learned tomorrow morning the Liberal government is moving to ban single-use plastics in this country. It comes after an international promise led by Canada to reduce plastic in the environment. This, though, would be a full ban established with the private sector over time. That means things like plastic straws, utensils, takeout containers and other one-off items will be banned as early as 2021. And the problem the government and environmentalists say is staggering. Take plastic bags. Canadians throw away more than 34 million of them daily. That's almost one bag for every Canadian every single day, winding up in landfills or floating in our oceans and rivers. And those plastics can take as long as a thousand years to decompose. Salima Shivji looks at the plan and whether it will work. At Ottawa's Bridgehead coffee chain, a near total plastic ban is already in effect. Things that we've been doing in shop for the longest time, we don't even think about anymore. Um, but there are no stir sticks at our condiment counters. We actually have real spoons and we wash them. Real spoons, compostable straws and cups that don't fit into the tiny garbage chute. There's only one outlier. An alternative that was compostable didn't work out. And we had to struggle with taking the decision to bring back um, a plastic lid. Uh, it was a sad day. But these may soon have to be replaced as Ottawa prepares to announce a ban on single-use plastics as early as 2021. A key promise in a Canada-led global initiative made a year ago. Five of us also agreed to a plastics charter, which speaks to our common resolve to eradicate plastic pollution. Since then, other countries have moved faster than Canada in what could be an uphill battle, forcing a change in consumer habits and investing in recycling technology, even though it's easier and cheaper to make new plastics instead. Still, many now say there's a sense of urgency. Canada does say that they want to take a lead on this issue. So I think the fact that they're making noises about moving now is encouraging, but it's clearly driven by the public outrage of continued promises for action with no action coming forth. Certainly some international outrage, as Canadian waste rotting in the Philippines and Malaysia led to diplomatic troubles and embarrassing headlines for a government working to position itself as an environmental leader. With Monday's announcement, the Trudeau Liberals will try to convince Canadians here at home that they're the party with a serious environmental policy, even though the NDP has already called for a similar ban on single-use plastics by 2022. The federal Conservatives will outline their climate plan later this month. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. So as we wait for this federal plan to kick in, there are several municipalities already on their way to tackling problem plastic. Anita Bath went to see what that meant for one B.C. community since the last straw. If you want to drip coffee, this is what you're going to get here. A common sound at the Blue House Cafe market. It's trying to go zero waste and customers stock up with reusable containers. Packaging that comes from things that we may have purchased in the store or comes from actually from other people that have donated it and they're then available for people to use. The market wanted to do even more itself after leading a successful push for a total plastic straw ban in North Vancouver's Deep Cove neighborhood. Despite paper straws costing more, merchants bought in. One maple and one honey place for here or to go. Honey Donuts owner Ashok Seferali says it's worth it. If you look at the long-term effects, of cleaning the environment is costing everybody more money. 
He welcomes a complete ban on single-use items. If there's an option, of course, people are going to use the plastic. But if you don't give them an option, then they're not going to use it. And the hordes of people flocking to the popular donut shop are unfazed by the change. I enjoy that it's environmentally friendly. So. <laughs> Works just as good as any other straw, so it doesn't bother me at all. But it's kind of nice that it's recyclable or compostable. While cutting down on plastic has seemingly been no problem for some businesses here, others say it poses a bit more of a challenge. Restaurants have mostly switched to recyclable containers, but some say under a total ban, it would be tough to manage takeout orders. But from drink containers to coffee lids, plastic is still everywhere in this environmentally conscious community. Many here, though, do hope it will be eliminated entirely. Anita Bath, CBC News, North Vancouver. A plastic ban could mean, of course, having to find alternatives to everyday items. But is plastic always the least environmentally friendly option out there? An exhaustive UK environment agency study found that plastic bags, in fact, use less water and energy to produce than paper and those reusable cotton bags. Researchers also found that a paper bag needs to be used four times and a cotton bag 131 times to match the carbon footprint of one plastic bag. So experts say, Andrew, the key to reducing the impact of shopping bags is just to use them and use them and use them as much <laughs> as possible, no matter what they're made of. I would say that makes perfect sense. OK, uh, looking ahead now to tomorrow night, game five, the Toronto Raptors in position to potentially win the NBA championship, making history. And boy, are folks getting that second. <laughs> this could be any bar anywhere in Canada right now, but it's not. This video comes from Shanghai, China. So we, the North, and everywhere else, too. People and pups alike are practically living in their raps gear. I've been wearing this all finals. Yeah. Have you watched it? Yes. <laughs> there are quirkier tributes, too, like spelling out raptors on your running route. There was a game on TV that said, if the raptors win game three, I will do one. And stupid me tweeted in, I will run the whole team name. And that name also giving rise to a new kind of anthem. This wasn't really for the team. It was more of like a joke thing because a lot of people been saying Raptor Foot, Raptor Foot. So no question the fans are ready. Uh, the players themselves spoke about that today. And if things do go the Raptors way tomorrow, the city itself will have to be prepared. Lisa Shing takes us through it all. Just blocks away from where the Raptors practice and play in downtown Toronto, dedicated fans work on their own three-pointers. Kawhi is my favorite player. Why? Because he gets some clutch buckets and he's always here for us. Most of these players come to this court every weekend, but there's a different kind of energy today. Go Raptors! <laughs> Their team, now Canada's team, is so close. I mean, it's big for our country. We only have one team in the NBA, it's Toronto. It's a pretty big achievement and it's a lot of excitement at school and outside of school. Today, the team's biggest star gave a shout out to the fans. I'm just enjoying the support and the energy that they're bringing to the team. <laughs> Energy could be a bit of an understatement. If the Raptors win tomorrow, expect the city to erupt in celebration. And scenes like these from recent wins could pale by comparison. Toronto police won't say what their crowd control plan is, just that they're working with the city. Early tomorrow, streets around Scotiabank Arena will be cordoned off. Concrete barricades will be put in place and more police will be patrolling. We've seen thousands of people in the downtown of one of the biggest cities in North America, peacefully having fun. And we want that to continue tomorrow. The city is engulfed and it's beautiful. This sports writer says it's been decades since she's seen the city so enamored with a team. I watch a lot of sports, like the World Cup or NHL playoffs that I think everyone's forgotten about at this point. And it's really interesting to see how everybody's adopted. And this is so much for me, what the Raptors are about. They are literally spreading joy. And even if tomorrow doesn't go their way, remember, there are still two more chances. Lisa Sheng, CBC News, Toronto.
And so here's the crazy part about all of this. Raptors fans have already been gathering in Jurassic Park to watch tomorrow's game on the big screen. Magda Gabrasalase is there with them tonight, and Magda, that is a whole other level of fan dedication. It really is. I mean, some of these fans have been here since Friday. Others arrived on Saturday and some have arrived today. And there's plenty, plenty of supports for the Raptors. Lots of signs here. Just take a look. Liam's holding one. We've got Andy, the sign guy, all in. And we have Roberto, Raptors fans from the Philippines. From Philippines. Are the Raptors a big deal in the Philippines? Oh, yeah. Raptors fans in Philippines. You also have a message for the Warriors. You want to turn that around for me? Warriors exit that way! Andy, what does all in mean? All in, which means that we trade some of the good players and we get three of the best players, so that's why we are here today. Right. And hopefully we're going to win the championships. That's we gamble and everybody's in, not just only Toronto, but for the whole country of Canada. And Liam, quickly, are the Raptors going to take it tomorrow? Yes, right. they will. Thank you so much. So these guys are going to be here all night, and guess what, Andrew? So am I. That's my luggage there. I'm staying the night with these fans, and oh boy. we'll see how it goes. I wish you all the best. Magda uh, Gabrasilase in Jurassic Park tonight and overnight. Uh, thanks so much. And hey, you can bet we'll be there tomorrow, too, with wall-to-wall -to -wall coverage, no matter how the game goes. But let's throw one more thing into the mix. How the Raptors found their way to the Canadian Open. That was Rory McIlroy winning the tournament in Hamilton, Ontario today, just down the road from Toronto. And here's what he did next, hoisting a Raptors jersey to a cheering crowd. Let's hope some of his good fortune rubs off. Moving overseas to those incredible images there from Hong Kong, a city brought to a standstill today by an enormous protest. Protest. Organizers say there were more than a million people out on the streets. They are denouncing a proposed extradition law, which would allow Hong Kong residents to be sent to mainland China for trial. There is concern that the law will be used to clamp down on political dissidents and erode Hong Kong's semi-autonomous legal system. And as Lindsay Duncombe reports, the response on the streets has been unprecedented. <laughs> The day ended violently, protesters pushing through barricades trying to storm Hong Kong's legislature. An eruption of anger after a protest the Hong Kong government acknowledged was peaceful. The crowds notable for their size and diversity. Fear over the government's extradition bill is widespread. I think the most important thing is to oppose this evil law, this woman says. Everyone can feel this today. The proposed law would give officials in Beijing the power to bring those wanted in Hong Kong to mainland China. There's no uh, rule of law, no uh, fair trials, no uh, uh, the humane punishment guarantees. So, uh, And it's uh, going to affect not just Hong Kongers, but anyone living or even just passing through Hong Kong. This is very scary. When Britain returned Hong Kong to China in 1997, it was under what's known as the One Country, Two Systems framework, allowing a separate legal system in the territory. In a joint statement last month, the British and Canadian governments expressed concern for their respective citizens in Hong Kong, warning the proposed law could have a negative impact on rights and freedoms. The United States has expressed similar concerns. Much of the anger has been directed at Hong Kong's Beijing-backed chief executive, including calls for her to resign. But it's unclear what, if any, impact this will have. Beijing indirectly appoints most of Hong Kong's lawmakers. Do you feel that this protest will make a difference? No, absolutely not. Then why do it? Just at least you fight for it. At least, like, you didn't give up anything. You fight for it. Fight until the end. In a statement, the government of Hong Kong said it respects people's different views and promised to listen to concerns. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Canada is home to an estimated half a million people of Hong Kong descent, and there were solidarity rallies in several Canadian cities today. Power to the people! Power to the people! Together we stand! Together we stand! 
This was the scene outside the Chinese consulate in Toronto today. You can see some of the protesters carrying yellow umbrellas that became a symbol of resistance in the 2014 pro-democracy protests. They were raised in Vancouver, too. That was one of the biggest protests outside Hong Kong. Dozens of families in Cuba are calling on Ottawa to listen to their concerns. The Canadian embassy there stopped taking in visa applications last month. And as Olivia Stefanovic tells us, they don't know what to do next. Dear Government of Canada. Querido Gobierno de Canada. Dear Government of Canada. A desperate plea from families stuck in limbo. If you are a country that clearly benefits from immigration, from the labor of newcomers like my husband, you owe it to these individuals to facilitate accessible visas. Canadians separated from their Cuban family members recorded this video. After Canada shut down its visa, an immigration application process last month in Havana. It deemed the embassy unsafe to protect diplomats who fell mysteriously ill complaining of dizziness, headaches and nausea since 2017 that have yet to be explained. And we don't know how long this process is going to take. Canadian Jacqueline Stein lives in Cuba with her husband. She applied to sponsor him to come back with her to Toronto, but now she may have to leave without him. It's pretty heartbreaking, um, especially being a new mom. Y, y a mí no. Amanda Riez is trying to get a visa for her mother-in-law. It could take another year for the application to clear. It's just, it's like they just don't care. This is a tough situation. The Canadian government has no immediate plans to reopen application processing in Havana. We have every intention and desire of continuing to provide strong consular and immigration support. At the same time, we have a really strong responsibility, a duty of care to our diplomats and we can't expose them to danger. The federal government is telling Cubans to travel to other countries to complete their applications, an expensive and time-consuming process that's simply out of the question for many. Most Cubans make fewer than 50 Canadian dollars per month. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, I want to take you out to Vancouver right now. We've got Briar Stewart standing by because, Briar, we've got some breaking news, developing story uh, coming out of the Dominican Republic about a former Major League Baseball player. Well, that's right, Andrew. Former baseball great David Ortiz has been shot in the Dominican Republic. Police tell the media that the 43-year-old was at a disco in Santo Domingo when he was shot by a motorcyclist who approached him. He was reportedly struck in the back and the bullet exiting through the front of his abdomen. He was transferred to a medical center where he underwent surgery. Now, several people have been detained in connection to the shooting. Ortiz, who was originally from the Dominican Republic, retired from baseball in 2016 after 20 seasons in the major leagues. He spent most of his career with the Boston Red Sox and won three World Series with the teams. He still lives in that city, still working for the Red Sox in a variety of roles, but is frequently in the Dominican Republic where he does business and runs a children's charity. We'll continue to keep an eye on this developing story and bring you updates throughout the evening. Back to you in Toronto. Okay, it's still ahead on the national. The question that stunned Raptor Kyle Lowry during today's news conference, you'll meet the kid who asked it in our moment. He's after our jobs, Andrew. <laughs> and six years ago, he changed everything. How Edward Snowden's decision to leak classified secrets changed him and everyone who's ever helped him. But first, she says she was subjected to a strip search when Canadian border officers couldn't find the drugs they were convinced she was carrying. He actually raised his voice at me and said, I think you're a drug smuggler. Go Public reveals hundreds of complaints against the agency. Next. A Calgary woman says she is scared to fly because she was so badly mistreated by Canadian border officers in Vancouver. She says she was falsely accused of being a drug smuggler and strip searched. And as Erica Johnson from our Go Public team tells us, she's not the only one raising serious concerns. It always comes back to Jill Knapp when she travels. Three years ago, the software instructor and Sunday school teacher was connecting through Vancouver Airport on her way home to Calgary after a trip to Mexico. She's singled out for what's called secondary inspection. 
There, she says, a border officer was almost instantly aggressive. He actually raised his voice at me and said, I think you're a drug smuggler. And he said, I deal with people like you every day. That officer checks her suitcase, nothing. Calls in a sniffer dog, nothing. I actually saw the rage come out of him, like he was mad that they couldn't find anything. He confiscates her phone, detains her. She asks for a lawyer, but one never shows up. Hungry and exhausted, worried her parents in Calgary have no idea where she is, Jill Knapp learns the only way she'll be released is if she agrees to a strip search. So I had nothing on from the waist down, and they actually made me turn around, open up my butt cheeks, and squat. This civil liberties advocate says Knapp's treatment was out of line. It's incredibly concerning that somebody would be forced into a situation where they agreed to a strip search just to end a detention. Also, it drives home the real power that CBSA agents have. We're trained to read between the lines. With that power comes a code of conduct. With professionalism, integrity, and respect. CBC did an access to information request for Canada's big three airports in Vancouver, Toronto and Montreal, asking for complaints about officer misconduct over two years. We discover hundreds of other travellers alleging they've been yelled at, bullied, even threatened. It's completely unacceptable and I have to say kind of re re repulsing that people go through this when they're simply trying to travel to their destination. Something really needs to be done. We asked the CBSA to come on camera and explain. It declined. In documents we obtained about Knapp's case, the CBSA determined its own officers followed standard procedures and guidelines. Jill Knapp says she was so traumatized she's developed anxiety. My husband's going to Mexico in July to see his mom, and I'm terrified to go. It's hard because I love their family, and I want to see them, and I'm scared. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. And if you have a story, idea, or a tip for a Go Public team, you can reach them at gopublic at cbc.ca. Still ahead on The National, the ripple effects of whistleblowing in the Sunday interview. Adrian finds out how Edward Snowden's life has changed since he changed everything. Plus, we go backstage at a dance program that's making a difference for Indigenous youth. Two, three, four, and... Some of the kids that are the most quiet shine the most when they're dancing. So emotional and so overwhelmed with excitement that you were able to accomplish something. Six years ago this month, Edward Snowden betrayed his government and in the eyes of many, became a hero. By leaking secret documents, he revealed the extent to which the U.S. spied on its own citizens. Today, the issues he raised around government surveillance remain all too relevant. Just last month, he warned a conference at Dalhousie University about a digital arms race as tech giants and governments develop more ways to gather and manipulate your information. So we thought it was time for another look at Adrian's recent interview. My name is Ed Snowden. I'm uh, 29 years old. I... Six years ago, Edward Snowden changed the world. A whistleblower who spilled the beans on his own employer, his own government. He revealed a secret NSA program that was collecting communications records of millions of Americans, even those who weren't under investigation for any reason at all. For that, he became one of the most wanted men in the world. Snowden, if he tried to cross the border, he could be intercepted and detained. As Oliver Stone portrayed it, Snowden was on the run, eventually fleeing to Russia. While in hiding, the program he exposed was forced to stop. He made a difference, legions of fans and still legions of folks. Still in exile in Russia, he doesn't do a lot of interviews, but he recently agreed to speak with us. It's very nice to meet you. How are you? We're all right, thank you. About spies, secrets, and safety, his and that of Canadians. You think Canadians need to be worried? I think so. I spoke with Edward Snowden from Montreal. You're far away from American law enforcement. It's still really complicated to talk with you. Uh, there's lots of secrecy, there's lots of confidentiality, and people are going to be wondering, you know, why is that? What, what are you still worried about? 
Yeah, I mean, look, the, the danger here um, is that we have a, a government in the United States nowadays um, that is charging whistleblowers, uh, people who have revealed information uh, that the government or even a corporation uh, considers to be secret, right? Um, but they have revealed this information for the public good. Uh, and yet, particularly when that information by the government of the United States is considered classified, uh, the government prohibits these people from making any defense in court. Uh, you can't tell the jury why it is that you did what you did. Um, so there's not really any kind of fair trial available. There's no system of justice uh, for managing um, these basically uh, contests in the United States between what the government says people are permitted to know um, and, and what they actually need to know to be active members in their democracy. Uh, and, and so when we end up on the other side of that and the government goes, you know, oh, you've broken the law, right now uh, they just kind of snap their fingers and you go to jail for half a decade, a decade, or the rest of your life. But do you think they're going to um, find you there? I think uh, under the U.S. sort of uh, legal regime right now, they embrace a practice called extraordinary rendition, uh, which basically means kidnapping. Uh, <laughs> it actually literally means kidnapping. Uh, where it doesn't matter whether you have asylum, uh, it doesn't matter whether you are protected, it doesn't matter whether you are prohibited from extradition in the country that you're in, uh, if they can basically just snatch you, it is entirely legal uh, in the U.S. system of law to take you back and throw you in jail. Okay, so that's that's why you, you are so careful, well, why we never see more than, than your head. I, I, I don't know where you are. I don't know what you do with your days. And, and you... Well, I'm actually just in my apartment, but... Uh... Yeah, you know, this is just my, my wall. Do you get recognized uh, on the streets in Russia? <laughs> That's what this is for. Um, you know, I actually, I, I don't get recognized very often, um, but it, it does happen occasionally. It, it's funny, it's one of those things that happens in uh, particular contexts. Uh, if I'm in the grocery store, no one recognizes me. If I'm on the metro, no one recognizes me. If I go into a computer store, Right? Like, I haven't even walked through the door, and instantly everyone knows it's me. It's the weirdest thing, but I, I think it's the way your brain sort of primes you for associations. And how do you spend your days? Uh, working. Uh, I'm the president of the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, and the majority of my day now is activism and outreach. Uh, but I'm particularly concerned with the kind of attacks that we see happening uh, against the press, both in the United States and around the world. Uh, I've been very critical uh, of the policies of the Russian regime right now, uh, particularly as it relates to internet freedoms um, and, and censorship. We see this also happening in Europe, uh, in places that you know you wouldn't traditionally expect it. When you said you've been critical of of how the Russian uh, government has handled press freedom, are, are you sure you want to you want to poke your hosts in the face like that? Well, look, it's. <laughs> You know, everybody knows uh, Russia's politics have been troubled. Uh, you know, this is, this is really the, the history of their politics. This is not something that's controversial or surprising uh, to a Russian citizen on the street, right? Uh, now, of course, the government might object to that. They might be upset about that. Um, but at the same time, I'm literally a former CIA agent. Uh, the Russian government doesn't really care what I say, because they can just discredit me in an instant by pointing and going, oh, look, the CIA agent doesn't like what the Russian government is doing. Surprise. Um, but I think there are people that are listening. And the more voices that talk about people who go too far, uh, the more skepticism that people uh, have in, in their own government increases. And that's a vital thing. Um, we also need to remember that a government that is trusted too much and too freely, that's given too much leash, Time and time again, the lesson of history is that they're going to get wrapped up in that leash eventually and take us down with them. It's a strange position for Snowden to be in. He told secrets in order for people to be more cautious about their privacy. Safe in Russia while criticizing Russia, asking Canada for help in accepting as refugees those who once hit him, while then issuing a caution about Canada, about how this country is not as free as we may assume it to be. You think Canadians need to be worried? I think so, because what we have forgotten um, over the last century um, is that the kind of peace and liberties that we inherited uh, from the work of previous generations, uh, that's very much not guaranteed. Um, that is the product of a constant struggle uh, to make things better and more progressive and more free, right? 
And we are constantly working uh, against the sort of reactionary pressures of people who go, uh, we've gone far enough. It's a dangerous world. There's dangerous people. And, and that is true, right? Um, but the way to protect against these dangers uh, is to live less freely. It's to constrain what everyone can do. And this is kind of the idea uh, that in order to protect an open society, we need to kill it ourselves first. Uh, and that's something that I fundamentally disagree with. And, and I think everyone who believes in the value of a free and open society should believe in. You know, given who you are, what secrets do you think need to be told next? <laughs> There's so many. Um, I think a, a, a vital document uh, that everyone has forgotten about, it's, it's disappeared in the, the United States political conversation, uh, but is absolutely necessary and consequential, is the torture report, uh, the, the secret history of the U.S.'s involvement in the torture and killing uh, of people who were suspected of involvement in terrorism, but had been in many cases were entirely innocent. Um, those people are criminals, not just any criminals, but war criminals. And to this day, their identities have been protected and they have faced no consequences at all, uh, either domestically or internationally. Um, and I think that's a tragedy. And I think it's an existential threat to our form of government, or at least the, the form of government uh, that we aspire to have. Considering how precious privacy is, at what point do you ask yourself if what you did was worth it or, or made a difference? Well, I, I think the thing here is um, it's led to legal reforms in the United States, in Canada, uh, basically every country in Europe. We have the entire way the internet does business, which is surveillance capitalism, uh, coming under pressure and, and beginning to change. Um, everyone, even actually, ironically, uh, officials in the National Security Agency that, that condemned me uh, have said this was a good thing. Uh, this was something they themselves should have admitted years prior, and then it wouldn't have been a scandal because they would have had clean hands. Exposing uh, unlawful or unconstitutional activities is always going to be a risky thing, um, but that doesn't mean it needs to be a dangerous thing. And are you always looking out to think, is that guy going to kidnap me? Is this man going to be, render me back? No, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's been so many years now. Um, if the United States government is going to take some action against me, if someone is going to, God forbid, you know, assassinate me on the street, that's only going to prove my point. Uh, I've done as much as I can, uh, and I'm going to continue to do more and more as I have the days, um, but I'm satisfied with the choices that I've made. Um, and... However much time that I have, uh, I can only be grateful for. Thank you very much, Edward. Thank you so much. And still ahead on The National, changing lives through dance. I knew that moment that I was really proud of myself, that I did hell of a good job. The first Canadian talent competes for glory at tonight's Tony Awards. Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations was nominated for Best Musical plus 11 other Tony Awards. Canadian Des McEnough was not able to snag the win for Best Direction, but Sergio Trujillo, who was raised in Toronto, did win for Best Choreography. The Prom was also nominated for Best Musical, but Canadian Bob Martin missed out on what would have been his second Tony for writing the book. His previous win was for The Drowsy Chaperone. Why is it so hot down here, hotter than a crucible? And the Tony for Best Musical went to Town, a show with a Canadian connection. On the road to Broadway, it had a run at Edmonton Citadel Theatre and was partially developed there, and tonight, the Citadel got a shout out on live TV.
Welcome back. 130 firefighters were called out to this inferno in London's East End. Flames quickly engulfed all six stories of this apartment building. It brought back memories of the Grenfell Tower tragedy that killed more than 70 people two years ago. However, in this case, it appears no one was seriously hurt. The biggest airline in the U.S. is extending its 737 MAX flight cancellations into September. American Airlines is scrubbing more than 100 flights a day. MAX jets were grounded worldwide in March after crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. Boeing has yet to formally submit a software upgrade to aviation officials. And disappointment for all these St. Louis fans tonight. They had a shot to close their series out and clinch the Stanley Cup, but they lost tonight's game against the Boston Bruins, which means it's all going to a high drama game seven Wednesday night. The Blues have got a long-standing grudge to settle here. They last lost the Stanley Cup to the Bruins back in 1970. Okay, now let's take you behind the scenes as more than 100 youth from Nunavut, Manitoba, and Ontario rehearse the show of their lives. They are part of Outside Looking In, a nationwide nonprofit dance program dedicated to inspiring Indigenous kids. They recently performed on one of Toronto's premier stages, charming a crowd of thousands. But before that, we caught up with two dancers and their choreographers in a training camp outside of Toronto. They told us about the power of dance and the impact it has on their lives. All right, wicked work. My name is Solomon Harper, and I am from St. George Point First Nation. I think dancing is like really fun. Um, when I dance, I usually let go all of my emotions. Let me see your overbite, mm, or a little smirk. Let me see your nasty face. Everybody's like, oh, and then you have a... <laughs> my name is Nino Vicente. I work with Outside Looking In as a choreographer. Listen up, did you get to hear me clap once? Did you get to hear me clap twice? You can hear me go whoop, 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 whoop. All right. That energy's building up. The place that we're in here is about an hour drive west of Toronto. This year, we have over 114 youth from all across Canada. It ranges from grade seven all the way till grade 12. And these are the First Nation Indigenous youth of Canada dancing inside this barn. And this is pretty much home for us for the next two weeks. Make sure the Garden Hill Juniors are by. It's cute. All right. All right, pick it up. You guys want to go practice? So you guys need to make sure you have My name is Queenie Sigubin, and I am a dancer, choreographer, and mentor. I spent five years in Garden Hill. Garden Hill is a fly-in community, meaning everything that they get needs to be flown in through a plane. The number one thing that I've seen change with the kids is that they're a lot more just self-confident in, in themselves. And don't get me wrong, like they still have days where they feel low. And living through it, I think, gives me more of a reason to keep coming back because I do know that dance provides some sort of joy and happiness and escape for some of these kids. Where's the sassiness? You give me that twinkle. So while you're dancing, you just I feel like a new person. Um, this year is my fourth year in doing a lot. Mm, growing up, I used to be um, picked on as a kid because of how um, my teeth look. And just something like that. I'm scared of people thinking weird, something about me. I'm just more social with me meeting new people. I'm able to actually talk with new people, have conversations with people, and get to know people a lot more. It also helped help me with my my self-esteem. I wasn't really into school that much. Um, I was kind of a slacker. But when all I came, I, I wanted to keep pushing because I love dancing that much. I ended up finding that I knew that I really like learning. It's like I wanted to be someone. I wanted to be something. Uh, I like school and my favorite uh, subject is math. I am like uh, about 80 percent average <laughs> of my guide. Uh, the choreographer, Nino, right? He wants us to push our limits way high as we can until it's really done. And that's what it takes. Every single individual has to keep that 100% high 
It takes a lot of time to be that good. One, two, three, four, and eight. Some of the kids that are the most quiet shine the most when they're dancing. Especially if it's their first time, I would have girls mostly cover their mouths always. And this is how they would start to dance. But as soon as the warm up music would come on, like you can see them like opening up, like body language, like they start to open their shoulders and stuff like that. And like even that alone says a lot about just how, how they feel. The Sony Center stage is the biggest stage in Canada. Dancing for them on that stage is what they look forward to the most. That three minutes of them dancing is what they go home and remember. Sony Center is a huge stage that fills up thousands of people. They step on, you see their eyes just open up and you see that they're like, oh, this is really real. Hold up. I was scared because I didn't realize that there would be that many people there. Pause! Hold up! I knew that moment that I was really proud of myself. That I did hell of a good job. I was so proud of myself. I was so proud of everyone there. You get so emotional and so overwhelmed with excitement that you were able to accomplish something. At that moment, uh, I realized that there's way more to the world. For me, I'm just going to enjoy it while I am here. So when I go back home, I think I'm going to strive for more again and hopefully come back next year. Love that story. Next on the national back to the story the country is talking about tonight, tomorrow, an unexpected answer to an unexpected question in our moment. How does it feel to be an icon all over Canada, kids? Uh, I'm not a, uh, <laughs> that's a crazy question. I ain't never been asked that one. Uh -oh. <laughs> So before a Raptors game, the media gets to have its pregame, and you know we sit there and we pepper the players with questions, and they're, you know, predictable. Like, how do you stay calm? How are you feeling about tomorrow? What are you eating? I don't know. But today there was a different kind of question too, from a different kind of reporter, hard hitting Arjun Ram from CBC Kids News, and it left Raptors star Kyle Lowry momentarily speechless. And tonight, Arjun gets our moment. How does it feel to be an icon all over Canada, kids? Uh, I'm not a, uh, <laughs> that's a crazy question. I ain't never been asked that one. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I put it this way, man. I was once um, a kid, I was once in your shoes. Um, and to be able to, to, to know kids one day will want to be like me, um, I hold myself to a super high standard. And I want you to see, I want kids and I want you to see a, a man that's, you know, um, really professional, really about his business, um, but at the same time, he's still fun and, and all and, and loving and everything else. Davide, last That's question. Crazy question right there, boy. You last can't, you can't right beat side. that question. <laughs> you can't beat that question. You can try, but you can't beat that question. How how is it that it doesn't seem like Arjun is even the slightest bit nervous? No. For that like I don't get that. I don't know. And I, I like doing interviews and asking questions, but now I'm worried that Arjun is better than me. Anyway, we caught up with Arjun to see how he felt about all this attention. He's on TV, but this is how he felt about that moment. I was not expecting that, honestly. I just asked the question and expected an answer. But when he started off, he's like, whoa, I've never heard that question before. I'm like, okay, wow, all right. And when the next person asked the question, he said, you can't top that question. And I was, that's when I was like, wait, what's going on here? This isn't real. I'm still very shocked by his answer and how nice he was to me. Aw, 
It's good when you can stump someone and make them think in a question. So Arjun, kudos to you. Well done. Today. <laughs> but okay, so but here's here's a pro tip that I just thought of. Yeah, yeah. The, the secret, though, you know, you ask a really nice question like that, yes. but then you follow it up with a really mean question. You know, like like Kyle, I noticed you were suffering in the first quarter of the, yes. of the last. <laughs> Well, this is how I do interviews with politicians. <laughs> now you've now you've uncovered my secrets. There you Arjun, go. Arjun will get there. Some free advice. <laughs> <laughs> That's the national for this Sunday, June 9th. Have a good night. Go Raptors, go.